one of the things I, I want to talk to you about when we talk about uh, sex and sexuality, I'm going to use the terms gender and sexuality, and I'm going to use those knowing, I think, the deficiencies in, the, in our culture and right now the challenges that there are with using gender and sexuality because um, a biological sex in the biblical worldview and gender are connected. And right now, I don't intend to communicate something different when I say gender than biological sex and sexuality. But I've used those as, for instance, your, your, your being a man and then your physical desires for sex. That's the difference in when I'm using gender and sexuality. Or your being a woman and then your desires within sex. So just um, to clarify that, because it's, it's, this is probably one of the most pressing areas in our culture and in our world where people are making a direct assault against this teaching of scripture. And if I can just encourage you, this whole group, almost, there's some minorities on the, on the, the, the chat and in the group. I want to make sure I don't miss anybody. But, but um, one, the main pressure, tons of the pressure, is coming from a specific window of society and specific cultural background. So you and I, because most of the people are here are middle class white people on the, on the chat here, might feel a ton of pressure like this is an issue that's pressing. But the voice of Christianity for the last 2,000 years and the voice of Christianity across the world, because the scriptures are clear, is still very unified and clear about sex and sexuality. And I just want you to know that. We have brothers and sisters in Africa and Asia and uh, really around the world who are, are ready to, to support us in thinking clearly about the scripture and hoping that we don't give in to pressures of the culture. So that's not something I'm going to get into a ton today. What I want to talk about is two people who are in a biblical marriage, a, a man and a woman who have made an oath covenant to become one flesh for a lifetime. What role does gender and sexuality play in their lives? And the first thing that I want to do is, I didn't start my timer, sorry. First thing I want to do is at least remind us of the very first point I hear I have is gender and sexuality are created by God to be used for God, which is a rhythm you've probably heard me use over and over. Your marriage is from God for God. You're from God for God. And, uh, and I wanted you to know that um, we, we really, we want that to be the grain through which we filter everything. This is from God for God. But because of that, then I would say this, gender and sexual, sexual desire are part of God's creation and providence, not your preference. So Abby's going to read uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, and then we'll read two. Well, first, let's just read chapter 1. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. All right, I'm going to read chapter two. These are review weeks, so I'm going to, or these are review passages, but the Lord God said it's not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever he called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds, and the animal in the sky, and the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now, just real quick, I want to, it's, it's obvious in these passages that God created male and female in his image, that he created their, their, their gender identity, and that he intended that as part of his good creation to reflect his image. We've talked about complementarianism already, that both male and female are distinct and necessary. And I'll just say this, the, the thing that's really helpful for me to remember is that if this is created by God for God, 
if it's part of his creation and then his providence, the way he rules and runs his world, right? It's not about our preference. And this is the thing that I think believers, we have to say out loud because we might not remember it or realize how much the world is pushing in on us. Gender and sexual desires, right now, the most important thing that is being told anyone is your preference is what matters. Your desires are what matters. But things come from God for God. The creator's opinion and the creator's organization, his providence of things is what matters. And what happens is you see the fruit in our world of the fact that people don't value God and his opinion. They think, wait, my preference is the biggest vote in this discussion. If I prefer a certain sexual desire or a certain gender identity, that should win the day. And it's very clear that the, the creator's providence and his plan is not factored into that. And we as believers should all of all people be willing to gladly say we have a good and loving creator and we should be starting with him, not anywhere else. All right. So that's going to set the table for really how we think about this. And number two is gender and sexuality have been marred by the fall. So I want you to realize you live in, live in, and have been shaped by a world full of sexual confusion and perversion, all right? And this is not something that is new. It's easy for people to get all bent out of shape because our world has sexual perversion. But the day and age in which Corinth, the first letter to 1 Corinthians was written was full of, of, of these same problems. Just read through the book of Genesis. If you read through the book of Genesis, I've been teaching Genesis to some kids on, on weekday mornings. And from from the gate almost right out the gate you have people multiplying wives from uh you have also uh you have people who are abusing who are taking advantage of you have uh you have voyeurism you have rape you have abuse you have neglect you have all kinds of sexual exploitation uh in just in the book of genesis if you take uh, prostitution. It is, it is very clear that the, the impact of sin is widespread in humanity, and Genesis, one of the chief ways it displays that is through sexual confusion and perversion, right? So um, I just want to make sure that I say that out loud, because what's happening is, just like I said, hey, your preference isn't the, doesn't rule the day. Right now in Lincoln Park, I coached uh, a young lady who was in our backyard telling me, hey, I'm going to make a transition to, to identify as a man, right? There are middle schoolers who, that was four or five years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And there are middle schoolers in the school and maybe in high school now where they're demanding a certain pronoun and the teacher's protocol at school is that these pronouns have to be granted to them. Your kids you and I are actually being shaped by this. And I actually think though, you as parents or some of you as parents, you're gonna see this in your kids. But what's wild is when we start talking about sex in a minute, you're going to see in your life the places where the world has shaped your opinion of sex. And so you just have to say it out loud. Okay, the world's actively shaping this huge part of who we are. So number three, all right? Gender and sexuality are still good gifts from God within his design. You don't have to throw, I think I just spelled that, wow. Sorry, you don't have to throw making babies out with the bathwater. And this is one of the things that I really want to press home in, in the rest of our time when we think about two passages from 1 Corinthians and then some practical applications, is that sometimes the response from Christians has been an unhealthy aversion to sexuality that has done two things. It's left believing couples in a, a, an immature stance about, about this huge area of their discipleship, but it is also left, um, it's, it's left a lot of people in with only the world's categories so that there is no active voice from believers about the good gift of sex, but then there is actively this wearing down and shaping of the mind from the world and we have to be able to say no, no no we are going to turn away from the things that are corrupted and perverted 
but we are actually looking at a world that was built with sex in it before the fall, right? And we wanna make sure we embrace that. That's why one of your exercises is, I'm skimming over these because they're review and then one of them, your exercise is to read the Song of Songs, Song of Solomon, uh, to think about that, all right? But let's go to number four, because this is where I think it really is starting to press on the way we see our body and our world. Uh, gender and sexuality are transformed by union with Christ. God's body, his choice, all right? So Abby, can you read verse uh, chapter six uh, of First Corinthians, if you wanna turn there with us, chapter six, verses 12, um, and then go all the way, yeah, through the end there. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All of the sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. All right, so let me ask you a question. Do you see there are two kinds of union in verses 15 and through 17? What are the two unions that are mentioned? Well, if you look at the verses, it says union with Christ, right? That do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself, right? Then what's the other type of union that's mentioned? In this context, it's union with a prostitute, but in general, the union is sexual union, right? That sex with our physical bodies is actually a uniting of the two people. And here's what, you, here's what you need to ask yourself. Okay, so why are these two unions significant to Paul? Well, he actually says that they impact each other, that they affect each other, right? And this is where I'm going to tie some of these points together in a minute, but already you should start to feel if you have an unbiblical view of sex where you think all sex is dirty, or all sex is inappropriate, or all sex is kind of like, well, a necessity, but not something that we really want God to know we do, you're going to have a tough time explaining the fact that Paul is particularly uncomfortable with sex in a cert across a certain boundary, but in the very next verses in chapter 7 is going to encourage sex of another kind, not because sometimes your body is united with Christ and other times it isn't, but because some sex, even though you are, your body is bought with a price and is actually God's body, you are united, your members of your body are Christ, member of Christ's body, you can participate in sex within marriage to the glory of Jesus Christ. That sexual union doesn't fundamentally uh, work against or shout against your union with Christ. On the other hand, Paul says, this act of immorality with your physical body that is in union with Christ is fundamentally speaking a different message and almost making an attack on your union with Christ in this union with somebody who's, who's, who's actually hating or rebelling against God in this sinful action. So why does Paul bring up the one flesh principle? Look at verse 16. He says, do you not know, verse, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. See, Paul understands that in Genesis chapter 2, we talked about this in the covenant, right? That the sex act of penetration, I mean, like, it's pretty obvious. This is a symbol of, God-built symbol of two people becoming one flesh, Right? And now, though it's not creating a marriage, right, this sexual act 
is an act of uniting together. It is an act of, albeit uh, rebellious and fraudulent and momentary, it's still an act of uniting yourself to a prostitute. And this is going to be important because I'm highlighting these points because I'm going to try and tie some of these together when I address wrong views of sex in, in the later in your notes. But I want you to look at that and realize like, oh, Paul definitely doesn't think that sex is kind of a neutral transaction between people, that the way our, our world talks about it. All right. Look at the, look at the, the next verses, though. The next question I have you for is this. Um, who owns your body in verses 19 and 20? And this is such a powerful thought. I think there's a lot of dualism in Christianity where people kind of treat the spirit as where we worship God and our bodies are like this necessary husk that we just kind of, you know, it, it like carts our brain and our spirits around until Jesus comes back. And then everything will be spiritual and will be balling. But actually what the scripture tells us is that Jesus comes back physically and he remakes the physical world. There is no human existence that is not embodied spirit. We are physical and spiritual. We have an immaterial and a material and our bodies matter. What you do with your body matters now because your body, specifically you, is you are going to be raised in the resurrection. Now, yes, through the power of God, you will be remade. You will be a new creation in the sense that Christ will have purified and transformed your resurrected body. But the scriptures give us the real concrete hope that we, our bodies, will be raised. Just as Jesus' body went into the tomb and came out new, just as a seed is planted and comes out different when it sprouts from the ground, but still is connected, our bodies matter. Our bodies and how we treat them, the way we steward our health, but especially here, right, what he's talking about is sexuality. So the question I ask you this is, what does ownership, this ownership have for, for um, what implication does this ownership have for how you use your body? If it's God's ownership, all right, because I, I don't think I read the verse and made it clear. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor, your God, honor God with your bodies. Do you notice what he's saying, though? Think about this. He doesn't say you were bought with a price and just kind of leave that to think like, listen, your spiritual allegiance is to Jesus, so don't commit this sin. What does he say? Honor God with what? Your bodies. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your physical body is something that God in, has bought with a price and intends to redeem, right? That's what the resurrection is all about. So, so your body and what you do is important. Okay, I don't want to get too far into this, but that's a really countercultural picture that, that I think there's a lot that has snuck into the church where it's like, well, like my spirit is committed to God. And then it doesn't matter how I take care of my body or not. It doesn't matter how I use it. It doesn't matter what it's for. I just, it's kind of like this dualistic, as in spiritual is good, physical is bad. That's not the picture the scripture presents. All right, but let's keep thinking about this because then there's this next piece that I want to read from the next couple of verses in chapter seven. <clears throat> Gender and sexuality are transformed by the guide of love. So they're transformed by knowing that we're united to Christ, <clears throat> but then by the guide of love. So Abby, can you read 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 1 through 7? I gotta get a drink. Mm -hmm. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you as your, has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. <clears throat> all right, so what's, it, what's in verses 2 and 3 the reason that everyone should have their own husband or wife? Notice he, he, notice he uh, um, 
Notice how, how Paul, just by the way, makes it clear that each man should have his own wife and his wife have a, have a husband, right? That's just, just there, there's so many layers in scripture where it's clear and repeated the, the framework that God expects in marriage. But, but what's the reason? Because sexual immorality is taking place. Sexual immorality is any kind of sex activity that's outside of the bounds of marriage, all right? So sex activity within marriage is, uh, is good and honoring to God. Somebody who's unmarried can be immoral. Somebody who is married can be immoral, all right? And, and usually when we say someone is married and immoral, often then we're talking about the extra word we could say is adultery, right? But sexual immorality in the biblical understanding of this word would include any kind of, of sexual activity that is outside of marriage. So I don't want to get too lingering in this, these things, but just frankly, the legal definitions of like rape, I think are, are maybe places where we would, they've influenced us too much to think about sexuality, where it's like not, penetration is not in, when you become immoral, okay? In fact, it would be like, any kind of sexual assault, if, if you thought about somebody who was unwilling being a part of that sexual activity and it was classified as assault, those would all be an immorality as well. Even if it's two willing partners, I mean, I, and anything that I wouldn't want somebody else to do to my wife without her permission, if she was doing that, it would be immorality or vice versa, me, right? Any of these places where we say the boundary for somebody to be comfortable about this happening. So frankly, I'm just gonna shoot straight. I think that, that really we have to wrestle and think about the fact that, that the scripture's understanding of immorality would, be, would, would probably include things like making out and, and that, that it's actually a much more intense perspective of what is protected within the marriage union than, than many times our culture we really think. It's very countercultural when you think about Corinth and the way that sexual activity was going on there. But he, he, he thinks immorality is a huge deal. We're supposed to honor, our, honor God with our bodies. And so he says, you need to be married because this is the right place for God to have this good gift. Look what he says. What does he say by, by marital duty? Or, or a, some of you, I don't know if they have translations that say conjugal rights, but it says in verse three, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. What does that mean? It means sex, right? It means sexual intimacy. It means that a part of being married, being one flesh, is the fact that then you two have right to the goodness of, the gift of, the joy of sexual intimacy together. That is a right, not a privilege, so to speak, because you are now one flesh. This is and this is the way Paul begins to describe it. Because I'll ask you, look at verse four. What do you think Paul means by a spouse having authority over his or her body? Uh, over the spouse's body. Well, think about what we've been talking about as the essence of marriage. That a spouse, a couple is one flesh. And that this person is, is this the, the, the sinful rivalry that we talked about in, in when we talked through love and what creates conflict, this marks uh, our whole lives. And so it's no surprise that in, in our speech, we might still speak in a way that shows we think we're hostile to each other or that we need to get for ourselves instead of pouring out for each other. Well, that's not just gonna happen in our speech and our thoughts, it's gonna happen in our sex life because we're so used to sex being this commodity where we either use it for our advantage or it's something that we have to go all out and do whatever we can to get, right? Depending on gender or depending on position and desire, you just, this is what the world is used to. And so honestly, when, I, when, when we read 1 Corinthians 7, there's probably some fear that rises up in your heart when somebody says like, well, hey, this, the husband has authority over the wife's body and the wife has authority over the husband's body because you're thinking, well, this is, a, this is ripe for misuse and abuse, right? This is ripe for somebody to say, hey, you, you have to give me what I want, right? But actually, what you should see in this is it's not that he says, hey, the wife has to give for the husband, right? Like you could 
label this some kind of patriarchal weird thing if it was just Paul saying the wife has to put out for the husband or something, right? But actually what is being said is this mutual service, this mutual love, this mutual care where just like the married couple thinks my whole self when I vowed to marry you was I'm going to give myself to you. Well, now they no longer consider their body as something that they're holding back from their spouse. It's an act of giving, but they're both in a race to give. They're both in a commitment to love. They're both in this this posture of serving the other with their bodies. Not one person saying, making demands and the other one saying, I don't want to, but I have to. They are one flesh seeking to serve each other, at least in Paul's desire for how they look at sex. So what, I mean, how does this affect your intimacy? Well, it should be, I think, um, actually what I want to do is this. I want to, I want to hold that question for you. I want to go down to our misunderstandings because I think it'll help us tie a bow on how we think about this. But I want to point out one thing, verse five. All right. When can you decide to deprive each other of sex? Looks like it says here, do not deprive each other except perhaps for a by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Okay. Everybody who's been married, like premarital counseling, I usually say this and people think, oh, what in the world? But then when you have kids and you have a busy life, and then all of a sudden you realize that there's barely time to have sex, there's barely time to do anything, you could understand how Paul might say, a couple would say, hey, we're going to actually take a time of fasting because we want to seek the Lord. But they're going to do it by mutual consent and only for a time because, because God gave this good gift and immorality is a real threat. All right. So when there's a consented on desire, but the normal case and course for marriage should be recurring sexual in intimacy because these two people have become one flesh. OK, so let's talk about the misconceptions. I think this is a helpful way to frame it, because for me, it highlights some of the places where we um, where we go off the rails because of our culture's pressure. Wrong views of sex. The first one I've written is an impure necessity. It, it, I hope there, that, that the, the reality is there's always people that are watching or talking that we meet who are actually looking at sex as something that's like, well, we, you know, you kind of have to have it to have children. And, but I still don't know that I feel comfortable with the idea that this is a good thing. And you might all kind of giggle. I can't, I'm glad I can't see your faces, but the truth is, let me, let me say it this way. If you feel uncomfortable praying about your sex life, then you probably have an unbiblical view of sex. You have something where you think, well, this is kind of dirty. This is kind of darkness, right? Like what does Psalm 139 say? Even the darkness is light to you. You know, the things that you do in your bedroom with the lights out are fully seen by God. And here's what you have to recognize, that that's very easy to feel like, oh, crap. But that's an unbiblical thing. Inside the bounds of your marriage, you can freely come to the Lord about a significant and important part of your discipleship and life together and pray to him and talk to him and ask him. Because just like every other part of your life, there are highs and there are lows. There are good and there are bad. There are days where there's struggle and there are days where there's sweetness in every portion of your life. And what's crazy to me is there's a lot of Christians from conservative Christian backgrounds who've taken a worldly view of sex that is, or I should say a, an out of whack view of sex, that sex is dirty, it's an impure necessity, and, they, and they, the way they don't, they don't see it until I say, are you willing to pray together or pray to God and talk to him about your sex life? If you are uncomfortable praying about sex, you don't have a biblical view of sex yet. All right, sex within your marriage, just to be clear. All right, the second one is impersonal transaction, okay? And this is where, um, I mean, honestly, the Corinthians were sort of like this. Hey, a guy's got needs, you know? They, that's what they say, well, the food for, food for the stomach, stomach for the food. And, you know, you just have, you have these desires. You're basically one step up the food chain in the evolutionary process. And, you know, pigs mate and gorillas mate and humans mate. And you kind of just have to, you have to do that. And, and then the other side of that is that it's like a, a commodity 
that is happening from this where so singles hook up because they both got, you know, we got to sleep with somebody or you can't just, you can't just be single. Right. And actually what the Bible presents is an, it is one of the heights of our one flesh union. And what I mean by that is this, you have the opportunity to express the physic express physically what you feel and are committed to with your whole person. Right. <clears throat> there are some things that, that are challenging to communicate with words as far as care for, uh, attention to, and commitment to, even challenging to actually feel and embrace as far as being together. But in God's good design, sexual union is a place where physically it is not only a display of your union, but it actually does something to strengthen your union. It does, does something to strengthen your one flesh intimacy. And the, when the world, when the world's understanding of this, like, well, it's time because the husband has needs or the wife has needs, and, and you're still living that way within a, a biblical marriage, it's a detriment rather than thinking about, wait, this is a chief place where I get to show how much I think of love and care for and delighted in my wife or my husband. That's, we have to not, we can't let it be separate where we say this is kind of like a physical piece, but we're spiritual beings. Again, that dualism sneaks in. The next one, <clears throat> I see this a lot, and this is a passion driven. You know, the TV shapes us like this, okay? Where it's like, especially unmarried couples, uh, or not unmarried, um, premarital counseling. There's like this, this vantage point where Hollywood, the only thing they've communicated is that you like, you know, you stumble through the door, ripping each other's clothes off. And, and sex is just this epitome of kind of, um, you know, like, like it's only about passion. And, and you know what, when you get married, you probably have a little bit clearer eyes on that. But you know what still really is common is people only thinking that sex is something, this is where our culture is so emotionally driven and so shaped by this, that there are people who think you should be only having sex when you're in the mood. When both of us are in the mood, that's when we have sex. But one of us isn't in the mood, well then we don't have sex, right? And I, I'll just tell you, there's a book called The Meaning of Marriage where Tim Keller does an incredible job of showing how dangerous that is because it's really like gambling on the whims of your emotions and the chance that you're both, you know, just waiting for the stars to align. Well, imagine if the other acts in your marriage of ways that you showed your care for and love for someone or commitment to someone or something that you did only when it was perfectly stars aligned. Like I only do laundry or I only make meals or I, I only write, you know, say words of encouragement when it's just the stars are aligning and it feels natural and it just bubbles out of my heart. Well, your marriage would slowly erode because we're not only are we sinful, but life is stressful. And, and I'll tell you this, if, if you don't take that out of the box, that passion driven mindset where it's like, unless we're both ready to, you know, we're both frisky and we're both looking to tear each other's clothes off, that's going to kill your, your sex life in your marriage because that's just not the reality that can, can you imagine, okay, for instance, the two slaves receiving the instruction Paul writes to the church at Corinth about caring for each other and thinking like, oh yeah, I work my tail off all day for somebody else. I have no choices of freedom in my whole life. You know how often that they're just feeling like the pictures, the sitcoms and things like that paint for us are just so out of touch with, with the history of human existence that sure, we have a lot of freedoms. And so it might make sense to us that we think it's only about passion. Now, do I want you to have passionless sex all the time? No. <clears throat> okay, I don't want you to feel like, oh, so I need to get passion out of my sex life. No, emotions and desire are a good thing. You're going to read Song of Solomon. And I fr frankly, you're going to see it and you're going to go, oh, <clears throat> this is a huge portion of it. But devotion and desire are connected. And sometimes an act of love and devotion is something that is what brings you there. And then you see actually uh, God use 
physical intimacy to create more desire, to create more passion. I think that, that it's a both and. And so we have to get that passion only thing out of our ideas. The other one is um, performance oriented. And this, what I mean by that is um, a lot of people have sex uh, <clears throat> in two ways for themselves. Uh, oh yeah, I, I wanted to share one more thing as well on that. But so one of them is just like, it's all about how you're perceived, especially in a promiscuous culture where it's like the guy wants to be known as, you know, this stallion or the girl wants to be known as this vixen and, and desi being desired or being thought of as amazingly sexy or great in bed or whatever is this totally, um, totally mutated view of sex. Because what do you see in 1 Corinthians 7? Remember when we read it? It's an act of giving, an act of sacrifice and service of selflessness. It's not about me. It's about the needs of my wife. It's not about her. It's about my needs. We're both thinking, how can I serve? And what our world has done is constantly made it about like, how awesome am I? Or how sexy am I? Or whatever. And actually what the scripture is calling us to is making, okay, just like a simple way to say it is like the, the, the goal of our sex life should be the pleasure of our spouse. And when the Bible, I think that's the way that the Bible expresses the love ethic in the sex life of two believers. The goal of our sex life is the pleasure of, the adoration of, and the joy of our spouse. And when two people are in this war competition to make the other person more pleased, it is a beautiful thing for God to bring them together. But so that's so, so countercultural. It's so different than the world paints sex. It's about me and how I feel or me and how I'm perceived if I made you feel good or if I was whatever. It's never about the other. And the Bible presents sex as, an, as another piece of a life of service, as another piece of a life of love, self-giving. That's, that's the goal, is your spouse's joy, your spouse's pleasure. That's the goal of a sex life. Uh, that's, um, and that's where I think another place I just counteract is the, the pleasure only instead of, um, <clears throat> instead of covenant faithfulness, that we demonstrate our love, not just when we're like, oh, I'm feeling it. We don't just rate our sex life by, like, by the level of, of climax or something. We, we rate our sex life by the fact that we say, oh, I'm devoted to showing I love and care for my spouse. There's a lot of other things that I could say. Um, but one of the things I'll just say that is this, um, guys, a lot of times the challenge for you is to, is that you're separating the, the sex life from the fact that you're, this is supposed to be the pinnacle of, or a centerpiece in a communication of your whole life giving. There's a lot of guys who want to get sex but they don't want to give their whole self. That's actually why there's so much sex outside of marriage where they're just running around, you know, trying to be gratified and they're unwilling because they're being cowards to give their whole life, to give an oath that binds them to this woman. They just want to, you know, get off. That's disgusting and deadly and wicked. But within a marriage, even after people get married, here's what happens. There's a lot of guys who just are waiting till the next time they can have sex. And they're completely disconnecting it from this fact that their whole life is supposed to be an act of service and giving to their wife. And then sex is a part of that as well. <clears throat> and practically in God's wisdom, I mean, if you were a servant-minded, loving guy, often your wife surprisingly ends up being in the mood for more sex than when you're a donkey, okay? But that's not the reason that you would serve someone. It still should be thinking like sex is the the... A, a, a huge piece of my service to my wife. And that means also sometimes you're in a position, okay, where, where, where self-control is an act of love. And I, I want to make sure I say something about that. Um, I know that sex is affected by the fall. I mentioned that earlier. And that doesn't just mean that we have wrong views of sex. 
there in a group this big, there are definitely people who are going through the repercussions of the fact that some of you have gone through uh, people have sinned against you sexually, but also that our bodies bear the effect of the curse and that things aren't normal or comfortable always. And that's something that you need to be clear about and be able to communicate about. And I want to make sure you, as couples, I'm so glad I can't see you sometimes when I talk about this, but I just want to say, like, if you're going to be willing to get naked physically, it's amazing how many people will get naked physically, but who will not talk directly or clearly about this very intimate and personal portion of their life together. And this is what I want you to remember. Sex is deeply personal. And so it's not this impersonal transaction. It's actually deeply personal. It's the, it's the giving of ourselves physically and spiritually. And so some of the deepest wounds you can cut within someone's life are in, in the midst of intimacy. And if you have ever in your marriage been in a time where things weren't you know, there wasn't the intimacy you hoped or things weren't working the way you planned or whatever, you have to guard your heart because you can be incredibly hurt. And then also often when you're incredibly hurt, you lash out and do incredible damage. And some of you probably experienced that when, when uh, you know, one spouse is in the mood and the other isn't, and then a fight erupts and words are said about intimacy or when somebody responds because you know they have an, an unbiblical view of sex and, and they're comparing their spouse to the objects that are placed in front of them in the media. And this comparison of someone, instead of saying, oh, this is my chance to show how much they are my delight and desire and I wanna give myself to them, all of a sudden you have a spouse who's crushed by the self-centeredness that's seeped out of their spouse who's comparing them to others. And that's, there's, there's so much. I think I really wish we could do like a whole series on a biblical theology of sex. One thing I'll say last is the Bible makes it pretty clear in Song of Songs, the idea that once you're married, your spouse needs to become the definition of beauty to you. And that's where there's a lot of pornography and filth and media marketing to shape your understandings of beauty that are uh, unbiblical. Now, physical health and physical beauty, I think they're real things. But one of the things that we've let happen is we've let our spouses stay in a race of competition for physical beauty that should not be there for them once you're married. They should define beauty to you, both spiritually and physically. Um, I can't go down these roads a lot more longer because I've run up on our time. But let me just remind you this, okay? God made sex good and he he it's a gift from him for him that that means that even though there are effects of the curse and there are pains in our body and pains in our relationships this is still a good gift and it's a part of your discipleship the way that you should be thinking about it is wait i am bought with a price body and spirit so my body and my sex life are part of my discipleship and devotion to the lord and then within my marriage I mean, sex doesn't go outside of marriage, <clears throat> but then within my marriage, it's, I'm devoted to the Lord by that guide of love, where I'm going to give my whole self to my spouse. I'm going to seek their pleasure and their joy as the height of my sex life. It's not an impersonal transaction. It's not something that I can just that I can just treat as a commodity to barter with. It's not something that just flows out of passion. It comes out of devotion and desires. It's something that I need to be thinking to serve, not to perform. All right. I hope this has been helpful. I really, every week, I feel like we only scratch the surface of all the things we could talk about. But I, I, uh, I've given you some uh, assignments, so I'm going to just reference them here. I told my wife I was going to joke that one of my assignments was that you all have to have sex. Okay. But one of the jokes is this. Okay. If you feel uncomfortable scheduling sex, you might have an unbiblical view of sex. Okay. That's part of the passion-driven one. Sometimes in the business of life, I've, I've actually seen it be really fruitful for couples where they just say, hey, you know, Tuesday night is getting jiggy night. And, uh, then, and then what happens is, though, they plan to show each other affection, just like you have a date night. I don't know why you couldn't think of that way, but we've been shaped by our culture. So here's your exercises, okay? You have to answer these questions in part one individually and then talk about them as, as a couple. That's pretty straightforward. 
Number two is actually I've given um, some interview questions to talk with a mature believer. And you might feel uncomfortable with that, but I think you should try, probably find somebody you're comfortable to talk with and do that. And then the third one, your exercise is to read the Song of Songs, and I've given you a guide question to answer there, okay? Uh, this is our last week. We, you know, if you guys are interested, you can say it on the Facebook thing, but I thought about doing a Q&A one day. Um, I am and just doing a kind of final week where we have to talk a little more. I'm interested, willing to do that, but no pressure. You can message me or post in some way that. But I also want to thank you for your time. I mean, I don't see any reason why uh, I need to be listened to for this long, but I really have been thankful that what just started out as a small idea with quarantine uh, has been able to be a help for some of you, and I'm praying for your marriages. So why don't we close in prayer? Father, <clears throat> thank you for the good gift of marriage. I pray that you, by your spirit, would strengthen each of these marriages for the glory of Christ. I pray that you would help us to be be walking as one flesh in our marriages as we depend on you. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. <clears throat>